tonight a world exclusive. Rich Spears has had a hell of a life. Former javelin champ, former drug smuggler, former death row inmate. But potentially his greatest claim to fame happened 50 years ago. Stuck penniless in London and desperate to get home for his daughter's birthday, Reg launched an amazing plan to smuggle himself back to Australia. It would see him smuggle himself 30,000 miles from London to Perth via Paris, Mumbai and Singapore in the dark in a box. 50 years on, his story is still incredible to listen to. He's been chased by the BBC, by other UK media, by Australian media. But last week, he chose to sp speak exclusively with Campbell Live. In a life rich with stories, there's one Reg Spears will be remembered for above all others. How did you get to the point where you think, I need to get back to Australia, I'll post myself? I didn't have any money, and you know, I want to go home. Simple as that. A story so remarkable, it has been turned into a book. 50 years ago, my father built a box and delivered it to Heathrow marked cash on delivery and sent to a fictitious address. It traveled 30,000 miles and 63 hours as air freight. London, 1964, and half a world away from home, Australian javelin champ Ridge Spears needed to get back to his family. I worked at the airport for a while and uh... I knew the specifications of these aircraft and the specifications of uh, cargo. So I went to my, my friend here, 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 that lives in Spain now, and he was a carpenter at the time, and said, let's build this bloody box. Three by five by two and a half feet. This would be Ridge's way home. The content was human. A penniless Australian athlete smuggling himself home. Johnny and I never thought for a moment this hadn't been done before. Shit, everything's been done. So we thought, but only this time, we're doing it, huh? All I want to do is get my ass on. And if I have to sit in this bloody box for a certain amount of time to get there, I'm prepared to do it. If you could um, imagine Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Steve Irwin from The Crocodile Hunter and you merged their two personalities, you've got somewhere close to Reg. Fellow javelin champ Johnny McSorley, Ridge's old mate, and the man who'd build the box. I didn't want to do it, but then I got um, a personality and character that just wore me down. <laughs> he wanted it, he wanted the box, he would do it. You, you, I, I know that he'd just jump in a cardboard box and go, he was committed. And from that point, so was Johnny. The box was built. This box we've had made, it is exactly the dimensions of the box Reg posted himself in. It is five by three by two and a half feet. It looks pretty big. I'm five foot ten, so I'm going to give this a whirl. Now, whether you'd want to travel around the world in this thing in the dark, we'll find out. Vanessa, could you just close this up for us? This is horrifying. No thanks. Did you ever worry about your safety or do you just think, I'm in a box, it's a couple of days, well, I'll be sweet. you just hit it then, mate, that's <laughs> it. That's how it happened. I just get in this bloody thing and let's What's go. the worst that can happen? Exactly. What's the worst that could happen, Lachlan? You know, they're going to say, you in the box, get the hell out, we're going to put you in prison for stowaway. Huh? OK, I'm not dead. And I never thought I would get killed. Because I, I had a good look at it before I did it. You know, sometimes I act like a fool and I'm a total fool. We knew we were doing wrong. He'd gone as rubberized emulsion, which is fictitious, for a shoe company, which, is, which was fictitious, and collected by Mr Graham, who was fictitious. So, Reg, we've only gone and knocked up a crate for you. Get out of here. Is, is it a good feeling seeing it again? Well, it certainly brings back a few <laughs> memories, let me tell you. Huh? 
Rich knew he'd have to deal with the dark, but he also had to prepare for a very long haul. I had uh, belts inside, belts on either side and over here to hold me in place if necessary, and another belt holding a bag up there, so because it counterbalanced the weight a bit. So you, you had your basic crate and then a few things to, to keep you comfortable, uh, yeah, keep you locked yeah. in. My blanket, pillow, yeah, I was, I was it wasn't as bad as people think. Yeah. If, if you don't mind being in pitch black, if that doesn't bother you, and you know you're gonna get there, well, sit in the pitch black. Just a few hours in, the call of nature almost put an end to his adventure. I had a catering-sized can of Heinz baked beans that I love. So I peered into this can, immediately let it go, and finished, I put it on top of the box without thinking, I just put it there. And um, stretching my walking up and down, stretching my legs, bloody thinking, so far, so good. And then I felt the, the inclination of the plane as it's going down. So I immediately, oh, got London, Paris, not far, got to get back in the box. Back in the box, lock the latches across, sit there, wait. The piss, the piss what to do, sit there and wait and see what happens. The plane landed, the hold opened, these French guys came on board and they got angry. They were pissed off. <laughs> and they were carrying on, but I'm waiting for them to knock on the box. Nothing happened. The hold closed, the plane took off. And off I go again, just like that. They thought the English had done it. They thought the English had This can of Aussie piss and they blame the English. Yes. How do you like that for a New Zealander, huh? <laughs> His journey was supposed to be less than 48 hours, but unexpected delays and unscheduled stops meant it ended up taking 63. Next thing, bang, the bloody thing lands. <clears throat> and it's in Mumbai and it's hot as hell. And they, uh, they take me off this plane and put me on the tarmac. I mean, the box is ass in up, uh, and I'm upside down because with straps in this bloody box, and I'm hanging <laughs> upside down a bit onto my shoulders. But so I've, I'm in the nude. I've taken all my bloody clothes off and I'm perspiring. How long had you been waiting in the nude in a box in the Bombay heat? Oh, it wasn't long, about an hour. And then there was a long hop, and I figured the next stop's got to be somewhere, and I was bang. Perth. Put on a suit, got a bag, walked over to the road and hitchhiked into town. I was there. Simple as that. Well, uh, you know what, we've, we've come to Australia, we're stuck with a box now, yeah. so... No, I don't want the bloody thing. <laughs> one's enough in my life. <laughs> in the dark, in a box, what goes through your head? Well, you know, what would you do, Lock? You'd be sitting there, you'd be thinking about yourself and all the things you've done up to that point. So I just sat there in the dark and did that. It was very simple. I think you have to be a very special person. And I think Reg was that very special person. Um, he, had, he seems to have a tolerance, a tolerance for, you know, um, pretty much anything and still come up smiling. Just a boy. Yes, talking to Reg, it's easy to get caught up in his stories and sheer force of personality. Look at this, this was 1968. Close to, close to 50 years on, mm -hmm. here we are still talking about that story. That <laughs> suggests it's a pretty remarkable story. I couldn't begin to imagine what was going to happen, but it did. And it carried on and, it's, and it sticks its head up every now and then. And here to we say, are. To say hello. <laughs> and I wonder truly, if, is this interesting? Is it? It bloody is. Ridge's life has been turned into a book, written by the son of the man who helped him all those years ago. A friend that Ridge forgot to tell, the plan had worked. It took me a week to get from Perth to uh, Adelaide, and then I never contacted my friend Johnny McSorley, whose uh, um, who's, uh, wife and son have written this book. And uh, he got worried. I was 
biting my nails down to the elbows, thinking, for God's sake, I hope nothing's happened to him. Did he think you were a corpse in a box? Yes, he, he did. He, he approached a, a, a journalist that we both knew, and uh, he said, oh, ticker tape, nothing on the ticker tape these days, but somebody dead in a box. No. Goodness gracious me. What a strange thing to ask. Yes. I spilled the beans and said, look, this is what's happened. And firstly, he didn't believe me. And then I said, it's Reg. And he said, Reg? He said, I believe you. And then it blew up. It went, it went berserk. Reg was headline news, famous across Australia. But those headlines soon died down and Reg began to find himself in the papers for other reasons. I'm a guy from Port Adelaide, from a working class family. Sport drove me through all of this uh, and eventually I finished up smuggling drugs. You ended up on death row. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes I did, yeah I did. Um, which, which but but again, again, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm an Australian and uh, well, I'm, uh, we've got a positive attitude. I always thought to myself, I'll get out of this somehow or other. And the opportunity did come up. The Sri Lankan customs knocked off half a key of, of smack. I was home and hosed. Evidence tampered with continuity of evidence. Go home, Reggie. <laughs> then I came here and did three years here. <laughs> so remarkable are his exploits. A screenplay of the book has been written with film rights still to be optioned. These days, Reg is content with the pathways of his beloved South Adelaide. Walking along the beach he used to train on as a boy. A perfect spot for reminiscing about the long twisted road that brought him back to these shores. I'm not a bad person. I was an athlete doing criminal things. I wasn't really a criminal, if you could understand that. Um, I have no regrets. Why would you? You only got one shot at it. And uh, you want to know, <laughs> you want to let yourself know you're there. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't regret a moment. Now, in almost 10 years of journalism, Reg Spears has to be the best storyteller I have ever met. Although, to be fair, many of them probably aren't suited to 7pm in the evening. Now, that exclusive story was courtesy of some really excellent work by our producer, Vanessa Forrest.